hymn number 221, All Praise to Our Redeeming Lord, 221. hymn of fellowship. Let's take our Bibles and turn to that portion of text that we were looking at a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3. We've been looking at the names of God and in particular over the last several weeks we have been looking at the compound names whereby the name Jehovah or Yahweh is connected to a descriptive adjective or a character quality of God. We began our study of that fourth compound name of God last week, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. And we find that occurring in Judges chapter 6, verses 23 through uh, 24, where it is the picture of Gideon being called to do battle against the Midianites. And after he is called, he builds an altar and calls it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. It's rather interesting as we looked at that text because we had just studied Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, a military banner. And as we find the name Jehovah Shalom, it is in the context of Gideon being called to lead an army the army of Israel against the Midianites. And yet, the banner is Jehovah Shalom, the altar here. Gideon had no human qualifications to lead that army. We learn seven things about him. Number one, he was a coward. Number two, he was very, very poor. Third, he was the youngest and most insignificant member of his father's household. Number four, and perhaps one of the most important reasons why he was not qualified, was he questioned whether God was really God, whether God had actually done the miracles by which he had led Israel out of Egypt. And he questioned whether God cared or was able to do anything about the Midianites. That shows a very great lack of faith. Fifth, he had to have multiple signs to prove that God had called him. Now we know from what Jesus says and what the Apostle Paul says that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But Gideon didn't just require a sign, he required signs over and over and over again. Number seven, he was scared stiff when the angel of the Lord consumed the sacrifice in the fire, and he demonstrated his fear as he fell on his face, not wanting to die. A man not qualified, and yet a man called. That should give all of us encouragement, and perhaps it should put us on alert. God often calls men who are not qualified, and women, and boys and girls. Even though we are not qualified, he chooses us and puts us 
in the battle. You know, it's rather interesting why God does that. It's because the battle is the Lord's. It is not man's battle. The angel of the Lord who appeared to Gideon, of course, as we've seen in previous studies, is the pre-incarnate Christ. And the final message that the Lord gave to Gideon, as we looked last week, was, Peace be unto thee, fear not. That's why Gideon named that altar Jehovah Shalom, the peace of Jehovah, or Jehovah our peace. We saw that that first phrase, peace be unto thee, was often spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ. It was spoken most frequently after his resurrection, but many times also during his earthly ministry. That second phrase, be not afraid, was also frequently on the lips of our Lord, and we looked at many passages concerning that last week. We saw that the word fear occurs 385 times in the Bible and the word afraid 189 times because fear is basic to the human condition dating back to the Garden of Eden. We are commanded 63 times to fear not in the Bible because we are fearful by nature. Now if God gives us a command once, we have to obey it. If he gives it to us 63 times, it's because he wants us to pay attention. How often we are afraid. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. But it was peace that was promised, and it was peace upon which Gideon built that altar. And Christ is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who is prophesied in Isaiah 9-6 as the Prince of Peace. He's portrayed that way throughout Scripture, where we find in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, speaking of Melchizedek, it says that he is, first of all, by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that, king of Salem, which is king of peace. We saw that Jesus had the authority and power to command peace as he calmed the storms and said, Peace, be still. And then we closed last week by seeing that Jesus Christ is the only way to have peace with God. Did you catch that? Is there turmoil in your life? Perhaps you are out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. Or if you have constant turmoil and trouble in your life, perhaps you don't know him as the Prince of Peace. The only way to have peace with God, the only way to avoid the judgment that will come, is to know Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For he, that is Jesus Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition that was between us. And that's where we pick up today as we continue in the final few points related to Jehovah, our peace. Peace with God requires holiness. Very important for us to understand. You remember that passage we saw a minute ago in Hebrews 7.2, Melech Tzedek, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. And that is what joined to the fact that he is the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. The king of righteousness is the king of peace. And so if we would have this peace with God, it requires holiness. It requires holiness both in our position and it requires holiness in our practice. The law condemns us because the law reflects the holiness of God. Jesus fulfilled the law so that we are no longer under the condemnation of the law. And so we have positional peace with God through Christ. We are seen in him. But we also need to understand that to remain at peace with our Heavenly Father, 
We need to be living a life of holiness, for that is what pleases him. Ephesians 2.15 tells us, speaking of Christ, having abolished the, in his flesh the enmity, that is the hatred, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. That's our position. We find it stated in verse 17, He came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. But then we find our responsibility, what God places upon us as an obligation, if we would be pleasing to him. He ties two things together. Just like Jesus in his person ties together king of righteousness and king of peace, so we are told that these are the things that we are to follow in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness. And listen to the last phrase of that verse. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Peace and holiness. We have peace in Christ, and because of that, it should flow through our lives so that our lives are lives of peace. But not complacency. We are to follow after holiness, to live lives that are pure and godly and well-pleasing in his sight. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Today, the Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the Lord who is our shepherd, Jehovah Ra'ah. The Lord is my shepherd. What kind of paths does he lead us in? He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Every one of the names of Jehovah that are compounded together interface with one another and fit together perfectly so that you cannot have one without having the other, cannot have this one without having that one. Where he leads us is in paths of holiness. The Lord who is our peace is also the Lord who is our righteousness. And he leads us in paths of righteousness. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Your life reflects the state of your inner being. If you have a life that is filled with chaos and turmoil, complexity and sin, it reflects your inner being. If you have a life of peace, that is internal peace, regardless of what surrounding circumstances have, it reflects your inner being. If you have a life of holiness, it reflects your inner being. It reflects your relationship with your Heavenly Father. What is in the secret compartments of your life? Eventually it will come out. Eventually others will know it by what they see in your deeds and hear in your words and understand from your motives and your emotions and your expressions and your attitudes. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Fruit unto holiness. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting Holiness in the fear of God. Ephesians chapter 4, that you put on the new man, 
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. If you're saved, you're no longer under the control of what Paul calls the old man. And he gives us the picture of putting on the new man, just like putting on a new coat, a new garment. And that is true holiness. That's what God has called us to. 1 Thessalonians 3. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. That is your goal. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That's why John says our desire is to not be ashamed at his coming. Because every man that hath this hope, the hope of the imminent return of Christ in him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Oh dear people, this is not merely for young people. This is for people of every age, if you are a believer in Christ. For God hath not called us, 1 Thessalonians 4, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Hebrews 12.10, For they verily for a few days, speaking of our earthly fathers, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. God didn't want to merely place us in Christ so that we would have a positional relationship whereby he looks at us and sees us as holy in Christ. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his Son. He is trying to make us, through the working of the Spirit of God, through the proclamation of the Word, for the transforming discipline that he brings into our lives, he is causing us to be partakers of his holiness. The God of peace requires holiness. The gospel that Christ has entrusted to us is the gospel of peace. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6.15, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Do you know the context? What is it in Ephesians chapter 6, where our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? It's in the midst of the spiritual armor that is given to us for spiritual warfare. That's where we find the gospel of peace. Just like we saw Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, that is the military banner that leads into battle, we saw... Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah our peace, given to a man who is about to lead an army into battle. And so we find the gospel of peace is given to us to put as shoes on our feet as we go into battle against the hosts of hell. Peace comes because Christ is, in fact, the victor. And we've seen that in Revelation chapter 19. He has already won the war at Calvary and the tomb and the resurrection. I know in some times in the past I have shared a story with you from World War II. My dad told it to me many years ago. He was in that war. And he tells us, or told us, he's with the Lord now, about an incident after the surrender of Japan where some of the American forces came across a tiny remote island where there were either three or four, I don't remember exactly how many, but three or four Japanese soldiers still stationed. They had not heard that the war was over. They had not heard that their emperor, Hirohito, who called himself a god, had been defeated. And so as the American forces came to this tiny remote island, these Japanese began to fire on them. They had for years been stationed there, 
Every day they would get up and do their military drills, waiting for an invasion. Every day they would get up and polish their bullets and clean their rifles, waiting for an invasion. And the war passed them by. And when they finally saw someone whom they didn't recognize stepping on the island, they thought the attack had finally come. And the only way that anyone was able to convince them that the war was over was they had to bring a man who had been a commander over that small group of Japanese soldiers to the island and he spoke to them in Japanese and they knew who he was and he told them that the war was over, that Japan had lost the war. Dear people, the battle, the war, has been won at Calvary and at the empty tomb. But the devil is still mounting his forces out there refusing to admit that the war is over, that he has lost. He's still putting up skirmish resistance, and some of it quite deadly, against believers. But Jesus Christ is the victor. Satan is a defeated foe. So the one who is our banner is also the one who is our peace. Being at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ changes our life. It changes our worldview. It changes our emotions and our relationships with God and with other people. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. A fascinating word, that word translated keep. It comes to us in the English with the very same concept. If you will read ancient British literature, you will discover that they spoke of the strongest part of the castle as the keep, a central tower which was solid stone up to about 20 feet with a small opening in the side and a ladder up to the side so that if the enemy breached the external fortifications, the royal family could climb the ladder, get into the keep, pull the ladder up behind them, bar the door and be safe from attack by the enemy while they were waiting for reinforcements to arrive. Do you know what your keep is? It tells us in Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God which passes all understanding, you will never understand it fully, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That is a marvelous promise, folks. When everything seems to be falling apart, when the enemy has breached the walls, when the castle has fallen, there is still a tower where we are safe, where we have perfect peace, where we have all the necessary resources, where we can look forward with expectancy and eagerness to our Lord's delivering return. It is the peace of God which passes all understanding. Jehovah, our peace. Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There is coming a day when peace will reign on the earth because the Prince of Peace will be here all things in heaven and all things in earth. It's because of the blood of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. It's another magnificent verse here. Let the peace of God rule. That word rule there is the word for an umpire. The umpire makes the decision as to whether the, the guy who just slid into home plate is safe or he's out. Let the peace of God rule. He's the umpire in your hearts. God gives us graphic word pictures so that we might understand Jehovah Shalom. 
God who is our peace. It doesn't matter what else is happening. He is the keep in the center of the fortress where we are safe. His peace. The war is over even though there are those who are still fighting that war. But he determines in our hearts when we let him do so how we will respond to those external stimuli. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to the which you are called in one body and be ye thankful. I love Second Thessalonians 3.16. Now the Lord of peace himself now, who are we talking about? That's Jesus. The Lord of peace himself give you peace. You might say, I don't want to take it from the hand of somebody else, but Jesus is here and he gives you peace. Now, notice the next phrase. This verse goes on. The Lord of peace himself give you peace always, by all means. This is supposed to be the continual state of the Christian. Perpetual, uninterrupted, unbroken. Always. And it's exciting to know that last three words, by all means. God can use all kinds of things in our lives to bring us to that point whereby we are at the state of equilibrium. No longer turmoil, no longer fear, no longer desperate anxiety, but a state of perfect calm. I know you've all seen pictures of beautiful mountain settings in the forests around, and in the center is a tranquil lake, absolutely perfectly at peace. The book of Revelation describes a sea, which is a sea as of glass. Think about the smoothness of glass. No ripples, no waves, no cracks, no icebergs crashing toward your Titanic. Absolute peace. Isaiah tells us, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. When you take your focus off of Jesus, you no longer will have your mind stayed on him and you will no longer be in perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him Remember the keep? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, not sometimes peace, not haphazard peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed. That is, you focus. Here is the one thing that you look at. It is a perpetual gaze whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth. That's faith. Not merely faith for salvation, not merely faith for position in Christ, but faith for the daily Christian life. Whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth. Present tense, active, going forward every moment of every day because he trusteth in thee. Don't trust on something else. It will always fail you. The God of peace be with you always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. Oh, another wonderful thought as we look at scripture and how many there are to look at, but we'll see a few. Peace with God now means that we have peace from both God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. That occurs many times in the New Testament. 
Having peace with God means we have peace from God. For example, Romans 1, 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Since we are at peace with God, we have peace from God. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you can understand when Gideon got into the right relationship with God, why he built the altar there and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abbezrites. And how wonderful it is to know that we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember those verses? It's a peace that passes understanding. It's a peace that guarantees life, not death. It is a peace for time and for eternity. Peace be unto thee, fear not. Thou shalt not die. Christ has risen and has conquered death. Eternal death has been conquered. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There are practical implications to that. Therefore, my beloved brethren, when you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourself, what is it there for? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Remember about having that steadfast gaze on Christ? Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It changes your life when you are at peace with God and have peace from God. You're able to move forward instead of wiggling in fear and immobilized in one spot. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know whose mind is stayed on thee, that you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That brings us to at least the beginning part of our next fifth compound name, Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord is my shepherd. You know it well from Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I hope you can say that. The reason the one who is the Lord is our peace is not merely because he is also Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, but because he is Jehovah Ra'ah. He is the Lord, our shepherd. Psalm 23 tells us at least 14 things about the character of the one who calls himself our shepherd. 14 specific details are given to us in this psalm. First, he is personal and personally interested in us. We see that by the very title, a psalm of David. Not just a psalm, but David is applying this to himself. We see it by the fact that the words I, me, my, and mine occur 17 times in these six verses, plus that personal psalm of David. 18 times it is emphasized 
that the one who is the shepherd is not only personal, but he is personally interested in us. He's not a machine that sits in the sky. He's not some big thing up there that you know, gambles the dice and whatever falls happens to us by fate. He is a personal God and he is personally interested in us as individuals. The second thing we discover is we know his name. Yahweh is my shepherd, the Lord, Jehovah, the one whose compound names we've been looking at, the one who declared himself to Moses at the burning bush. We read that this morning in Exodus chapter 3. God, who is the covenant-keeping God, is the one who is the shepherd. The third thing we discover is that he meets all of our actual needs. I shall not want. He doesn't always give us everything we want because that's not good for us. It's like the old saying, give a boy and a pig everything they want and you'll get a good pig and a bad boy every time. God does not give us everything we want. But he does give us what our genuine needs are. All of our desires are not good. Some of our desires are evil. Some of our desires come from the flesh and others are motivated by the world around us. Others which come into our thoughts are thrown there as barbs from the evil one. He meets our needs. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The fourth thing that is very interesting to me, and I think all of us have been through times where everything seemed to drag to a halt, where perhaps we were on a bed of sickness, or perhaps we were sitting and twiddling our thumbs in an airport. I've done that on more than one occasion. Where nothing seemed to be going on. God enforces rest when we need it. He makes me to lie down. It's interesting because in the green pastures, normally the sheep would be eating. <laughs> he makes me to lie down. God knows the times when we need to take a break. He knows the times in our lives where we need to be stilled and quieted from all the busyness that's going on around us. He brings us to a place whereby we can focus on the shepherd and not on anything else. Whenever I get stuck in an airport, and that's happened so many times I couldn't count them, I try to always have either a small Bible with me or if I've left it in the suitcase that's on the plane somewhere, I spend time in prayer. I pray, of course, for all the, quote, regular things. But then I begin to look at the people who are going by me. And I begin to pray for them. And if I'm sitting next to someone, I try to start a conversation. And share with them the water of life where the Good Shepherd has led me beside the still waters. What do you do with your downtime? God brings these downtimes into our lives so that we might refocus our attention on who He is and what He has called us to do. He makes me to lie down. His rest is beautiful and beneficial in green pastures. Not merely eating the green pastures, but lying down in the green pastures. It is beneficial and it is beautiful. Too many times we get agitated, we chafe at the bit, we want to get moving, we want to get something done. I'm that kind of a person. As you know me, I'm a type A personality. I don't like to waste time because wasting time is wasting your life. And we only have so much of it. And we've got to get going. We've got to get point, from point A to point B to point C to point D to point E. And we're going to try to get all the way to point Z before the end of the day. And then we're all frustrated at the end of the day. I've had many days like that. 
And I've had to say, Lord, you accomplished what you wanted to do today. That's why every morning when I get up, I quote Proverbs chapter 16. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. It's like Martin Luther once said, he said, I have so many things to do today that I'm going to have to spend at least four hours in prayer. <laughs> God can make things fit when we can't. Just like mixing some kind of a mixture of water and oil together and getting the molecules in between one another. Only God can do everything that needs to be done, and he may choose someone else to do something that you thought you needed to do. Beautiful and beneficial, and God accomplishes what he will. He gives divine guidance, that phrase, he leads me. Have you ever looked for divine guidance, for God giving you what you needed to know so that you could make your next step? You might have divine guidance in terms of where you know you ultimately want to be, but do you trust him every day? A shepherd who leads his sheep does not go over to the next mountaintop and say, Here you guys, come on over here! He walks down the path in front of them so that they will know precisely the path in which they are to walk. Divine guidance. You say, well, I, I've been praying for divine guidance and I didn't get a bolt out of the blue. Do you know what God uses to guide you? He uses his word. How much time do you spend in scripture? You want guidance on a particular issue? Do you have a concordance? Why don't you look up some of the key words related to that issue and see what God's word says about it? God uses his word. Oh yes, he uses the pastor preaching the word, and he uses friends, and he uses relatives, and he uses siblings, and for you young people especially, he uses parents. It's one of the primary things that God uses for young people to give them guidance is their parents. He puts you in a specific home with a specific father and a specific mother because God is going to develop in you through their hammer and chisel on your life He's going to develop in you the character of Christ. And praise God if you have godly parents because they will seek to teach you his word. They will know far more than you do at their stage of life than you do at your stage of life. And they will be able to see the problems you're facing. And they'll take you to scripture to show you the answers. He leadeth me. He gives us guidance through those whom he has put into our lives, but especially he gives us guidance through his word. It's interesting because the next point we see is his direction also keeps us safe and it provides us with refreshment. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You know, sheep, when they have their wool on, not right after they've been sheared, but while they've still got their wool, if they fall into water, they have a very hard time getting out because it's just like taking a great big piece of sheepskin and sticking into the water and it suddenly soaks it all up and it becomes very, very heavy. And without help, that sheep will drown. If he led them beside roaring waters and they fell in, they would certainly perish. But he leads them beside still waters where they can go down to the edge where they can stick their muzzles into the water and where they can drink and be refreshed. He leads us for our protection. He leads us so that we will have refreshment. And then we discover the next thing that the shepherd does. He helps us to recover from damage that we have received or sustained in our lives. He restoreth my soul. Have you been damaged? Have you been hurt? 
Have you had situations whereby you are totally and utterly exhausted, totally parched of being in the wilderness, injured, wounded, you feel like you could die? Jehovah the shepherd restores your soul. He restores. He brings it back to full vibrancy, to full life, to full energy, to full joy. He restores your soul. It's interesting that the next thing the shepherd does in his guidance and we made reference to this a few moments ago. He always leads us into righteousness. Remember when we were talking about the connection with peace and the connection to holiness? The one who is Melchizedek is king of righteousness. He is also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Those two things are always tied together. That's because the Good Shepherd leads us in paths of righteousness. Not merely a position of righteousness, but in paths, the place that we're walking in our daily Christian life. That's the Christian life. He leads us into righteousness. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. A life of holiness, a life of godliness. And then he tells us his motive for that holy living for his name's sake. We've been studying the names of God. You know, when we walk through this world, we represent his name. It is for his name's sake, for his honor, for his glory, that we are called to walk in the path of righteousness. God always defends his name. Do you remember when Sennacherib came and surrounded the city of Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah? And the prophet Isaiah was there, and Sennacherib sent his general, Rav Shaka, to blaspheme God. And Rav Shaka, in the ears of the people who were on the wall, said, Look, none of the other nations were able to resist me, and their gods could not stand against our gods, because we are greater than you, and our gods are greater than your God. So don't count on Jehovah saving you. Jehovah is just like all the other gods. He will never be able to save you. And he took the scroll in whereon this was written and laid it out before the Lord. And the Lord said to him, go and tell Hezekiah that he will not cast up a mount against this. He will not burn this city. He will not destroy its gates with fire. By the way that he came, by that same way he will return to his own country. And that night the angel of the Lord went out and smote 186,000. Assyrians. Who is the angel of the Lord? Who is the captain of the Lord's host? Who is the one who went and killed 186,000 and who will lead the army in Revelation 19? It is our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. With the breath of his mouth, he destroyed them. And they heard a rumor back in their home country, went back to that home country, back into Assyria that some trouble was going on brewing in the empire. And so Sennacherib decided he needed to go talk to his God, who was the, the one who gave him all these great, powerful victories. So he goes in and he's bowing down before this idol of a God named Nisroch. And his two sons, who came from his own lines, Adram, Melech, and Sherezer, killed him while he was worshiping in front of his own God. His own God couldn't protect him from his own kids while he was in an act of worship. God, Jehovah, always defends his own name and demonstrates that the gods of the pagans are nothing but wood and stone and brass and iron and dirt. Dear people, you represent his name. 
His motive for our holy living is for his name's sake. That's why he leads us in the paths of righteousness. Well, our time is up for today. We've gone beyond time. We'll pick up the Lord, our shepherd, Lord willing, next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the great and mighty, majestic God of the universe. How we thank you that the Lord is our shepherd. How we thank you that because of that there is never any need that is a genuine need that he does not supply. How we thank you, Father, that he leads us. He gives us rest, enforces the rest when we need it. It's beautiful, it's beneficial. It's divine guidance by which he leads us and it always is in paths of righteousness. He never leads us into that which is sin. He never leads us into that which is disobedient. He never leads us into that which is questionable. He never leads us into that which is wrong. He leads us in paths of righteousness because we represent his name. And you earnestly and jealously defend your own name for his name's sake. Father, we thank you for that. And we thank you that we can say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen.